now we'll move to our second speaker, um, Eugene Duff uh, from the uh, UK DRI at Imperial. Um, he uh, is a, uh, a data scientist focusing on a broad range of problems relating um, spatial and temporal uh, properties of brain structure and function, both at a macro and at a micro level. And um, Eugene, are you ready? And can I'll just pass it on to you for your, your session. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to talk today uh, about some of our recent work about um, using the UK Biobank to investigate potential implications of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID infection for neurodegeneration in the, in the future. Um, and I think this is an example of the type of research that really the UK Biobank can uniquely facilitate by having this huge uh, store of existing um, uh, existing uh, clinical data, which we can then augment in the in the face of of new medical questions and and challenges. Um, so the question we're really interested in is the uh, long term effects, uh, or whether what the long term effects of um, SARS COVID two might be. Um, it's been already well, quite well established in many studies that the infection by COVID is associated with increased risks for a variety of neurological conditions. Um, it, it, certainly in, in recent um, studies, they've seen a whole host of neurological conditions have raised hazard ratios for COVID-19 patients. Um, and while these are often most severe in, in people who have been hospitalized or have had severe COVID, um, numerous papers have pointed out that the risks and burdens are elevated even in people who do not require hospitalization during, during the acute phase of the disease. Um, and somewhat separately from, from this, uh, recently it has become increasingly clear that adult virus exposure of, of a variety of types seems to be linked to our risk for neurodegenerative uh, diseases um, down the track. Um, this is an example of a recent paper which utilized UK Biobank and the FinGen Biobanks. Um, Liv Einadel identified 22 separate viral exposures that seem to be associated with increased risk of different neurodegenerative diseases. Um, um, and often years and years uh, after the acute phase of, of the viral exposure. Um, this is a very active area of uh, epidemiological research um, and the relationships remain incompletely characterized. And, and specifically, I think there's still quite a lot of uncertainty about general and or specific mechanisms of why uh, people are more uh, likely to, to uh, be at risk of neurodegenerative diseases uh, after having these viral exposures. Um, and it's, it remains an open question whether, whether SARS-CoV-2 falls into this category, whether it may be increasing uh, risk for neurodegeneration and which uh, um, which what type of patients may fall un, may have this increased risk, um, but certainly this would bring large questions for uh, the implications of the pandemic for future dementia burden if if this does prove to be the case. Uh, now I talk about um, some studies that um, we've been involved in um, utilizing the UK Biobank. Uh, COVID-19 repeat imaging study. And you know, this was touched on a little bit in the previous talk um, is, and is, was a, uh, an extension of the UK Biobank Imaging Enhancement Program, where a large number, around 100,000 uh, uh, participants are being comprehensively imaged um, and, and around 50,000 had been completed prior to the pandemic. And during the pandemic, uh, around 2,000 uh, participants were called back who had been involved in this were called back and asked to undergo uh, uh, an accelerated version of the re-imaging program so that it would be studied uh, during the pandemic. Uh, of these half had we have had evidence that they were had uh, were positive for SARS COVID-2 uh, uh, had ha in some form while the other half uh, we have uh, no evidence that they had exposure to the virus. Um, this, this cohort is 
uh, perhaps a little unusual in, in the wider COVID research in that um, this recruitment process means that the cases were primarily relatively mild. I think it was only a, a relatively small proportion of people were hospitalized. But it does provide us a cohort where we have recently acquired baseline data pre-COVID uh, for a whole range of imaging and other measures um, from the UK Biobank, allowing us to have much more statistical power to assess the impact uh, of mild SARS-CoV-2 uh, on, on us and in the future. Uh, the, a, a major study that came out of this uh, was published last year by uh, um, our colleagues in the University of Oxford, um, uh, in which both Paul Matthews and myself were involved in, was an examination of the brain imaging uh, associated correlates of of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and this is looking at a, a whole diverse range of neuroimaging brain structural measures in both those participants who had had the SARS-CoV-2 infection and, and those controls who had not had it. Um, and what was found is that there were a, a variety of long-term changes in brain structure associated with having had this, having had the infection. Um, these are uh, associated with a, a number of brain measures and brain areas, uh, many of them associated with the olfactory, uh, olfactory areas, which are known to be a, a, a particular target of the virus, um, but also regions that are associated with, with dementia. One feature of these uh, changes is that they seem to uh, impact people more, uh, who are people who are older and more, um, and, and this is a, a common effect across, across a, a whole host of the measures we identified. And they're also in parallel to these changes in, in um, various brain measures. Um, there were parallel reductions in performance on cognitive tests in those that had, uh, we had evidence had had, had the virus. Um, and I guess while, while we, we don't have a lot of, um, it's, it's difficult to make a lot of inferences about the underlying mechanisms of, of these observed brain changes. Um, they Certainly there's some suggestion that they um, could be uh, in those brain areas associated with dementia, um, but, but it's still the, the brain, Im brain imaging data we have doesn't give a clear picture of what those mechanisms might be. So we're still unclear about the stability of these changes that we've observed, whether they may be returning to normal. Uh, and their implications for, for future health. So these uncertainties about from, from this study uh, spurred a, a further uh, assessment of this data set um, where we look, we have uh, acquired um, some biomarkers from the same uh, participants um, associated with dementia uh, and dementia-related conditions. Um, this is a, a study that has been initiated by uh, Professor Matthews, um, and uh, a, a, is a separate proteomic study to what was mentioned earlier, the O-Link one. Uh, this is specifically uh, assessing uh, dementia-focused um, biomarkers, particularly uh, the biomarker GFAP, which is a marker of astrocytic injury, NFL, a marker of neuronal or axonal damage, amyloid beta and amyloid beta peptides, um, which is associated with dementia-related amyloidosis, and PTAL, which is associated with tau pathology. Um, <clears throat> so these plasma samples that were acquired during the repeat imaging study have been uh, analyzed for these um, uh, biomarkers, and we're interested in whether they can provide more insight into the changes we've observed um, in, in this uh, really interesting cohort. Um, we know these biomarkers quite well. They've been studied extensively um, over the last few years as they've become available. Certainly, they uh, allow us to distinguish Alzheimer's disease from other conditions um, reasonably well, um, and they provide uh, um, markers that uh, uh, go over and above other risk factors to, to tell us whether someone may have a, a risk or may already have Alzheimer's disease. We can tell their trajectories over time uh, very well in the in this case of Alzheimer's disease. Certainly some of these biomarkers uh, uh, appear to be 
changed well before the standard uh, PET and other imaging based markers of Alzheimer's disease become apparent. These biomarkers have also been studied somewhat with respect to COVID and, and as well as many other biomarkers. However, with most studies of COVID, they've been examined during the acute phase of the disease or with respect to people who've had the disease uh, to an extent that they've been hospitalized or had very severe disease. So in, in this uh, biobank data set, we're really the first, for the first time able to examine these markers in people who have had a, a mild, uh, have been SARS-CoV-2 positive to some extent or a mild case of the disease. Uh, so quickly, the study design, um, we have uh, 624 uh, participants who have had uh, evidence of SARS uh, COVID positivity and 610 case matched um, controls. This overlaps the neuroimaging study. Um, as mentioned, we the evidence from the positivity for the SARS having SARS COVID uh, is from a var variety of um, sources, um, including GP records, hospital records, diagnostic antigen tests, and antibody. Uh, home-based lateral flow kits. Um, from this, we, for a number of people, we can estimate when they may have had the acute phase of COVID. Um, and we have a number of uh, uh, participants, a small number who were hospitalized who we can examine separately. Um, the participants uh, are well representative of the bio, overall biobank uh, cohort. Um, they're around 65 years of age, between 50 to 80. Um, they were assessed between 2021 and 2022. Um, and there's a period of uh, bet usually between one and five years between the initial assessment during the imaging uh, uh, assessment prior to the pandemic uh, and the one we recorded post-COVID. Our case of control groups are very well matched um, with only minor differences between the two. Um, now to, to to get to the uh, the um, what we see in these uh, biomarkers, first of all, the two biomarkers that are associated with um, axonal and neural injury, new inflammation biomarkers. Here, they previously in COVID have seen to be raised in the acute phase, but then return to baseline, and that's what we see here. We don't see any evidence of these being raised overall in the overall uh, uh, SARS CoV two cohort. However, in those participants who had most recently had the disease, there was some evidence that these were still raised. However, plasma uh, amyloid beta levels uh, are lower in the SARS-CoV-2 group or have been relative to the match controls. And this is, uh, um, uh, these, are, these are markers of amyloidosis which lead up to um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and, uh, and other related conditions. Um, <clears throat> this ratio that we see is, is significantly lower in participants who had previously tested for the SARS-CoV-2. And to an extent which seems to be to a similar, similar scale uh, of, um, of people who have a, a single copy of the APOE4 allele, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's no end of evidence that this effect is dependent on APOE status, uh, uh, and it occurs across all age groups. However, we find a bigger evidence for an effect size in the older participants. This uh, change or, or increased reduction in amyloid uh, beta uh, 42 explains a proportion of the reductions in cognitive scores that we've seen uh, uh, after the pandemic. Um, we also looked at the relationship to neuroimaging phenotypes, and we certainly we see a parallel changes between neuroimaging phenotypes and these and these markers, uh, although no not specific associations at this stage. Finally, the last mark we looked at, p uh, uh, which is a marker which is elevated in Alzheimer's disease but occurs after the amyloid uh, beta markers. We don't find this marker has changed at all uh, in the following SARS. Uh, COVID-2 um, exposure. So just to summarize quickly, um, 
we do find evidence of uh, amyloid beta levels changing uh, and a change associated with uh, SARS-CoV-2 positivity. Um, this is accordant with amyloidosis. It's certainly not a major um, a major uh, change, so it's not uh, it's um, associated or, or similar to the scale of of um, some genetic predisposition predispositions to dementia. Um, and as at a broader theme, this this sort of work is really only possible with this unique data set uh, made available from the UK Biobank's overall structure, and specifically this repeat imaging study that was specifically implemented to study uh, the impact and long-term implications of SARS-CoV-2 neurodegeneration. In the future, we're going to do more targeted analyses of the neuroimaging phenotypes associated with dementia, uh, integrate the other proteomic data sets and, and other biomarkers that have, that have become available um, in the UK Biobank. Um, and finally, just the cont contributors to this uh, work at Imperial UK DRI is Professor Paul Matthews, who really instigated this project, um, and a, a number of others who, who I've spoken to about this project. The UK DRI Biomark Biomarker Factory did the proteomics. Uh, Biogen has supported and provided input into the work, um, as well as the people uh, at UK Biobank, including Lucy Burke at Gray and Daniel Fry. Uh, thank you.